Hey guys, it's Libby. Welcome to the new bookshelf setup. I'm very excited about this because finally I can have what I've wanted for a long time and that is Bard Shrine. Here's my collection of Yales. I will be um, embellishing this area with more stuff as I, uh, as I acquire it. And today we are going to be talking about one particular Bard play and that is Henry V. Um, but first, we have a little bit of Bard Book Club housekeeping to do, so I just want to give you a refresh on what uh, our upcoming plays are. After Henry V, which is the, what month is it, May play, we will be doing Merry Wives of Windsor in June to wrap up the fall staff character. Uh, then in July, we will be doing uh, Measure for Measure, my favorite play. Um, and then in August, I will be taking the month off because I'm going to be traveling. I'm actually going to be traveling like one week per month in June, July, August, and September. Uh, so I decided to just do take August off in case I like start getting behind. I'll have August to like catch up in case I'm late for June and then to get a little head start for September. But in August, I do not want to leave you with zero Shakespeare content. So I will be doing a bard focused Q and A. So you can send me questions in the comments to this video or any of the other Bard Book Club videos uh, that I'm about to make. Don't do it on ones that, that are old because I may not see them. Uh, you can send them to me on Twitter. Uh, uh, two things that I will definitely talk about because I get asked them frequently. Uh, I'll talk about why I use the editions that I use and what my thoughts are on other editions. Um, and I'll also talk about the Hollow Crown um, because uh, on all my history videos, people are like, have you seen the Hollow Crown? I have. And then I was trying to think what play we should do for September, and I realized that we have not done a tragedy since the very first play, which was Othello, back in like, like a year ago now or something? Did we start in May of 2018? That might have happened. Um, so we need to do another tragedy, uh, and I've been doing kind of more uh, obscure works. You know, the two previous ones will have been Measure for Measure and Mary Wives of Windsor. Uh, so I decided I wanted to do a big popular tragedy. So we're going with King Lear. King Lear is a September play. There is a chance I will have to make two videos about King Lear. Um, if I do, I'm not sure how I would break it up if I want to divide it into like talking about the Lear plotline and talking about the Gloucester plotline, talking about the like viewing this as a family drama and then viewing this as a political drama uh, or just all of the stuff that happens in the first half of the play and all the stuff that happens in the second half of the play. Um, if you guys have opinions on how I should break up my Lear video, let me know. But now let's make like the Buddha and live in the present and talk about this month's play, Henry V. Hooray, we've gotten to the end of the Henriad. We did all four plays and this is the end. Are you sad? Will you miss the histories? I know the histories don't have a reputation for being super sexy. Hopefully you've changed your mind on that a little bit. Um, so what I want to do for this play, I'm going to take the same approach that I took to All's Well That Ends Well, which is I'm just going to go through it like chronologically through the play and sort of let you have a little window into my brain of the sorts of things that I think about when I read, because this play, it has like lots of themes, um, but they're like interwoven quite a bit and, um, you know, one moment can be relevant to multiple of them. And so I couldn't really tackle this in like a theme by theme approach. I also couldn't really tackle this in a character by character approach because there is one character in this play uh, and everybody else is a prop. Well, that's not true. Let's see. Henry V is the man to whom I was obviously referring. Henry V is a character. Um, I would say Fluellen is a character and Pistol is a character. Everybody else in this play is a prop. And Catherine. Cath Catherine's, Catherine is uh, a b just barely approached the level of character, I would say. But of course, before we enter into the text, I'm going to review the plot because there are some tricky elements to the plot of this. Like, I do not blame you if your eyes glazed over during the Archbishop's speech about the Salic Law. So let's get into the mechanics of this story. We open, Henry V is King of England. Um, this is relatively shortly after his father's death and so relatively shortly after we uh, ended the last play. He has summoned the Archbishop of Canterbury who has been doing some study into French succession law to figure out who the real King of France should be. And is it maybe should be Henry himself? 
yes, let us investigate this question with utter impartiality. Uh, so the Archbishop comes before Henry and says, here's the deal. It all comes down to the Salic law or the law Salic, if you want to be slightly more French about it, um, which states that uh, women cannot inherit the, the throne. So it's about to get very complicated. Let's bring up a family tree. Some of the names on this tree should be familiar to you from previous plays, but right at the top we have Philip III of France. So he was king of France, he died. Primogenitor says that the throne goes to his firstborn son, who was Philip IV. Philip IV had four children, then he died, and first it went to his eldest son, Louis X. Louis X died without heir, so the throne went to the next son of Philip IV, who was Philip V, who also died without heir. Uh, and so it went to the third son of Philip IV, Charles IV, who also died without heir. Oh my god, what is wrong with you, Capetians? Uh, Capet is the last name of this French ruling family in the way that Plantagenet is uh, the Henry, Henry's last name. Um, so here's where the conflict begins. The French say, okay, we went through the three sons of Philip IV, um, then he has a daughter, but women can't inherit, so the Philip IV line is dead, we have to go back up the family tree and then over and find the next child of Philip III, who was the Count of Valois, but he was dead by this time, so it goes to the son of the Count of Valois, Philip VI. And then, uh, uh, meanwhile, well, you know, Richard II has been happening and whatnot, um, Francis had some other kings, Philip VI was succeeded by uh, John II, who was succeeded by Charles V, um, who was succeeded by Charles VI. And Charles VI is the King of France at the time of this play. So that is the French view of the case. But here's what the Archbishop of Canterbury says. He says, when Charles IV died, um, Isabella had a son. And this son should have inherited the French throne. Because it's not a woman inheriting the throne. It, you're just going through the female line but the throne is being held by a man, so it's still in accordance with the Salic law. This son happened to be Edward III of England. Isabella had been married to Edward II of England, which went great. If you want to know more about them, uh, read Christopher Marlowe's play, Edward II. If Christopher Marlowe writes a play about your life, you know everything went swimmingly. Uh, so the French throne rightfully belonged to Edward III of England, who would have been Edward the, I guess, Edward I of France? Let's not worry about the numbers. Um, and then Edward III of England uh, unites the French and English thrones. So then the French throne should have descended uh, through Edward the Black Prince, who predeceased, predeceased his father, to Richard II, our main man. And then when the English throne passed from uh, Richard II to Henry IV, so should the French throne have done so, uh, which means uh, Henry V, since he's heir to Henry IV, is, should be king of both England and France. And then just ignore the Lionel Duke of Clarence behind the curtain. His line will surely not come back to haunt us in any way at all that could involve flower-based wars. I'm sure it'll be fine. So that's the trickiest part of the plot, but it is an important part of the plot because it is uh, the reason that Henry V is justified in fighting this war. He's not fighting a war to just like take some land, which would of course be immoral. He is fighting to give the French people the right to be ruled by their true king. Then Henry receives some ambassadors from the Dauphin. It is slightly noteworthy that these ambassadors are from the Dauphin, not from the king himself. Dauphin literally translates to dolphin, and it is the title given to the king's eldest son, so the heir to France. The Dauphin has sent him tennis balls, basically saying, I know you like to uh, play around instead of actually govern your country, so ha ha, it is joke. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, King Henry sends the ambassadors back with uh, information that he is going to come over to France and kick some butt and uh, take the throne that is rightfully his. So now the French know that Henry is preparing to attack. Then at the beginning of Act Two, the chorus tells us that three Englishmen have been bribed by the French to kill the king. Um, those three Englishmen are uh, Richard Earl of Cambridge, Henry Lord Scroop, and Sir Thomas Grey. However, the king finds out about this and decides to set a test 
to see how he will deal with these traitors. Um, so he uh, mentions casually to his uncle Exeter um, that there is a man who is currently in prison um, because he had berated the king, he had insulted the king, um, and you know, should we, uh, should we execute him, should we not? And this is fictional. There is no such man in the prison. Um, he is just seeing what the traitor's reaction will be. And they all say, oh no, you should show no mercy, just kill him. Anyone insults you, get rid of him right away. And then he's like, oh, well, that's a funny thing you say because I happen to know that you are trying to murder me, which uh, is, is worse than like insulting me. So um, by your own logic, off with your heads. And then they die. Uh, and Henry can uh, set forth across the channel um, where he makes a uh, straight for Arfleur, um, which is a coastal castle town. Um, he besieges the outer walls of Arfleur uh, and then uh, when he sort of get, approaches the inner walls, he issues an ultimatum um, to the governor of the town saying like, it's gonna be real bad and we're gonna like kill everybody and there's gonna be a whole bunch of rapes uh, if you don't surrender now. And the governor of the town says, I was expecting some reinforcement from the Dauphin, but he's barely not ready yet. So yeah, we surrender. So the English can move into Arfleur and sort of make that their base. Um, however, they don't really have enough time to like recoup and refresh themselves. The king has some plans for what he was gonna do, but oh God, we've gotten involved in the Battle of Agincourt. The Dauphin and all the forces of France are attacking. And there's like way more of them than us and we're tired, we're definitely gonna lose. Oh well, at least we can die with glory. Uh, and so the night before the battle, the king um, goes around the camp uh, in disguise and sort of tries to bolster the spirits of the soldiers. Um, he encounters one man named Michael Williams who was like, I am not impressed with this dude, the king. And the king is like, I don't know, I think he's maybe a good guy. Um, and uh, Williams, uh, challenges him to uh, a duel if they like encounter each other later so they exchange gloves and uh, each saying you know if you ever see when you see this glove again um, attack that person because that person is me um, it, implying that they, they need the gloves to recognize each other because it's too dark for them to see each other's faces uh, so then we have Battle of Agincourt and um, it goes improbably well the French lose thousands of men, the English lose less than 30. What the what? The French surrender, not just the battle, but the entire war, and the king meets up with Michael Williams again, and he says, nah, it's all good, man, and gives him some gold sends him on his way. Then, just in the words of the chorus, we learn that the king has like gone back to England and done some stuff and then he returns back to France and like we're not going to worry with the going home to England and the coming back. So the, the action of the play just stays in France and then we have a uh, treaty um, in which it is established that, uh, the, that Henry will inherit uh, the throne of France after the current French king's death and he is also going to marry Princess Catherine. And then as the chorus tells us, they all lived happily ever after and there were no problems with England and France ever again. That's why there's a whole nother tetralogy about it, about how everything went great. That's what happens in the Henry VI plays. And now finally, we can get into the text itself, um, which does not mean starting with the characters. In this case, it means starting with the chorus. Um, this is a, a, an unusually um, expansive chorus role for one of Shakespeare's plays. I think the only other one that comes close to it is uh, Gower in Pericles. It serves as the narrator. Um, Gower was the original author of the Pericles story, um, but here we have this sort of faceless chorus. And the chorus here is filling two functions. First is to call upon our imaginatory powers so that we can um, fill in the imagery of these vast battlefields of France and the thousands upon thousands of men fighting each other because they will not fit in the theater. We have like pretty low budgets. And second is to link this text to classical texts, specifically epic poetry, like uh, the Aeneid, the Odyssey, and the Iliad. 
this plot does lend itself quite well to the classical treatment with like the one practically superhumanly awesome guy doing all of these impossibly cool things, much of it in a military sense. And like Homer, the chorus uh, references the muse in the first line, Oh, for a muse of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention. And that line is both tying it to classical works and distancing it from classical works. We've got a reference to the muse, but it's a reference that the muse is not there. He's saying, oh, for a muse of fire, as in, I don't have a muse of fire, but that sure would be helpful. Um, the, the, here you have the, the playwright sort of portraying himself as uh, more humble um, and needing of the audience's approval. The playwright in Elizabethan uh, plays often takes a sort of apologetic stance uh, towards the audience. So you don't want to be boastful by replicating Homer and saying, oh no, this text was created by the muse. You're saying, this text was created by me, some guy, but I would have appreciated a muse. So no surprise to find the mythification of English history in this play, because we've seen it in the last three plays as well. Other thing that we've seen in the last three plays is uh, biblical references. Um, so uh, scene one, act one, scene one, line 29, um, they say of uh, Henry V, consideration like an angel came and whipped the offending Adam out of him, leaving his body as a paradise. Talking about how he has banished this sense of irresponsibility and is now acting like a good king, um, but this scene of banishment from paradise should remind us of um, Mowbray and Bolingbroke from Richard II. But interestingly, in Richard II, England itself is the paradise, as John of Gaunt tells us, but in Henry V, Henry's body is the paradise. Then moving forward to uh, Act 1, Scene 2, we've got the really long speech by the uh, Archbishop of Canterbury explaining how the Salic law works and how um, Henry has a right to claim the French throne. Um, uh, this is one of the longest speeches Shakespeare has ever written. It's over 60 lines. And so the, uh, I first had the experiential connection between this speech and book two of the Iliad, which if you've ever read it, I'm sorry. Um, it's very long. It's just a list of all the Greeks who were coming to Troy and all the number of men they had on the boats and how many boats they had and like where it feels like every dude on the boats was born and what his dad was like and what kind of moss grows on the rocks by his house. It just, it's a lot. Um, some people apparently like this thing, uh, and so we're sort of creating this tour de force of uh, French and English history. Um, uh, but it's also really important that uh, this is very clearly explained because this is the justification for Prince or for King Henry. He's not Prince Hal anymore. For King Henry to claim the French throne. Um, and we need to know that he is doing this in a just way, because otherwise he's the bad guy. So it's very important that we are very clear about this. So that's why, that's why that speech is so long. Then later in the scene, the ambassadors from the Dauphin enter, and they start by saying, like, is it okay if we, like, give you our message? You're not going to kill us or anything. Being an ambassador was a little bit of a scarier job in uh, the Middle Ages than it is nowadays. Uh, although, <laughs> depending on where you're going, it can still be scary nowadays. Because, uh, you know, you're not supposed to just, like, grab and kill ambassadors from foreign countries, but that could still happen. Um, but the king says, we are no tyrant, but a Christian king, unto whose grace our passion is as subject, as is our wretches fettered in our prisons. And this is recalling Richard II. Just because Richard II, Hotspur, and Henry IV are now dead doesn't mean we can't continue to contrast uh, Henry V to them. Um, so Richard II ended his life as a wretch fettered in a prison, and that is because he did not subject his passion to his grace. So what is a metaphor for Henry V was a reality for Richard II. 
Then we get to say a quick hello to some of our old friends from East Cheap, including Mistress Quickly and Bardolph and the boy, um, who was a uh, page to Falstaff. And we learn that Falstaff is doing poorly. Um, later in this play, Falstaff dies off stage. Falstaff does not appear on stage during this play, even though he is alive for the beginning of it. And one possible reason for this is that William Kemp was the actor who played uh, Falstaff in the earlier plays, and by the time this play was written, he'd had a falling out with the company and had left them. Um, and Shakespeare may have been re uh, hesitant to recast this iconic role. Um, so yeah, Falstaff doesn't appear on stage. It also means that um, we're gonna hang poor Bardolph. I think that the original intent was to have King Henry order the execution of Falstaff, because um, that's sort of the way things are progressing throughout the earlier plays. Um, and that would also be like a real emotional moment. We're like, damn, he killed him. Um, but instead it's Bardolph, who was like, also there. And then we move on to the docks at Hampton where the king is about to set sail and we have another parallel to the Iliad here, um, or not the Iliad, to the Trojan War. Um, so the Trojan War, uh, the Greeks were stuck um, on the Greek shores and weren't able to cross the sea to Troy um, for a while because uh, complicated reasons, but basically they solved it by doing a blood sacrifice, by sacrificing uh, Agamemnon's daughter. And um, uh, it's not it's not that like the winds are unfavorable and so the English can't cross the channel but we do still need a blood sacrifice in order to go across the channel we have to kill these three traitors and we get this very canny move from the king uh, in which he kind of lets the traitors decide their own fate decide whether they will live or die um, based on how they react to uh, what, what the punishment should be to this other guy. Um, this kind of reminds me of Prince John from the last play when he like pulls this like damn trick um, on the traitors in that play. And then the speech that the king makes when he reveals that he knows about the treachery um, really reminds me of his dad. So I'll read a little bit of it to you. The mercy that was quick in us, but late by your own counsel is suppressed and killed. You must not dare for shame to talk of mercy, for your own reasons turn into your bosoms as dogs upon their masters, worrying you. See you, my princes and noble peers, these English monsters. My lord of Cambridge here, you know how apt our love was to accord to furnish him with all appurtenances belonging to his honor. And this man hath for a few light crowns lightly conspired and sworn unto the practices of France to kill us here in Hampton. To which this knight, no less for bounty bound to us than Cambridge is, hath likewise sworn. But oh, what shall I say to thee, Lord Scroop, thou cruel, ingrateful, savage, and inhuman creature, thou that didst bear the key of all my counsels, that noosed the very bottom of my soul, that almost might have coined me into gold, wouldst thou have practiced on me for thy use? May it be possible that foreign hire could out of thee extract one spark of evil that might annoy my finger? Tis so strange that though the truth of it stands off as gross as black and white, my eye will scarcely see it. Comparing men to animals is a device that Henry IV used in his two speeches. He's got two big ones, one in each of the Henry IV plays, um, where he's like, what you doing, son? And he talks about, you know, England being overrun by wolves and such. Um, and then also this uh, highlighting the closeness of the traitors and saying that makes it worse that they would uh, betray is also something that Henry IV had done. And we have an interesting opposition going on here, a sort of chiasmus, if I may be uh, unnecessarily pretentious, um, in which Henry IV was saying to his son, I know you don't love me. In fact, I expect you to betray me and join Hotspur. Um, which we know is not true. We know that Henry V and Prince Hal does actually love his father and that he is not going to betray him to Hotspur. But here we have King Henry V saying, I thought you loved me and I did not expect you to betray me. And while Henry IV was wrong, Henry V is right. So that's a, that's an interesting dynamic. And then I think the really key part of this scene and the part that is going to resonate uh, later in the play um, is when Henry says, you have conspired against our royal person 
joined with an enemy proclaimed, and from his coffers received the golden earnest of our death, wherein you would have sold your king to slaughter, his princes and his peers to servitude, his subjects to oppression and contempt, and his whole kingdom into desolation. Touching our person, seek we no revenge, but we our kingdom's safety must so tender, whose ruin you have sought, that to her laws we do deliver you. First off, obviously, big contrast to Richard II, um, who, you know, everything was personal. Here we're starting to see a division between the personal and the political. And also, while this is a nice thing to say, we don't totally know that it's true. We don't have evidence that Henry is actually not taking personal revenge. He's taking revenge on behalf of the country. Um, and so this act, this claim, will have to be proved by later actions. And relating to this scene, we've got one more contrast with Richard II, and that is that Richard II merely banished uh, the traitors, which came back to bite him in the ass, whereas King Henry is like, we're not taking any chances, they gotta die. Then we hear of the death of Falstaff, and I think Marjorie Garber talks about this really excellently in her book Shakespeare After All, so I'm just gonna read you a paragraph from that. What has died with Falstaff? It is useful to compare the death of this Sir John to that of another iconic figure, John of Gaunt, in Richard II. The old fat man and the old thin man have a good deal in common. Both deaths signal the passing of an order long in power, the other Eden world of John of Gaunt, medieval, feudal, and hierarchical, and the world of misrule of Sir John Falstaff. The death of Falstaff reported in the second act of Henry V is a counterpart and fallen echo of that earlier defining moment. Marjorie Garber also talks a lot about how um, there is a, how Henry IV parts one and two have a lot of parallels and then how Richard II and Henry V have lots of parallels as you have probably picked up on. Okay, then we've got Act 3, Scene 2, which is kind of uh, a fun scene because we've got all of the nations of the British Isles represented. We've got Gower, who is English, MacMorris, who is Irish, although that sounds like a Scottish name to me, but whatever, Jamie, who is Scottish, and Flewellen, who is Welsh and speaks with this um, sort of comic Welsh accent. I don't think actual 16th century Welsh people said uh, peas for bees, um, but uh, that is sort of the, the signal to your audience that this is a Welsh stock character to have him do these P for B's mispronunciation. It also means we get the great line, Alexander the pig. So homodiegetically, we see uh, that King Henry V has followed his father's suggestion to create wars abroad so you don't have wars at home. Um, uh, Henry V doesn't have to worry about issues from the Scots or the Irish while he's off fighting the French. And heterodiegetically, we also have Shakespeare saying, hey look, isn't it great that us four nations are all together and like totally equal and happy about it. The Scots, the Irish, and the Welsh love being ruled by England. It's like their favorite thing. And then uh, regarding the very beginning of Act Three, um, uh, the chorus section and then scene one, which is actually just a speech, which is quite unusual in Shakespeare to have one, one scene where it's only one person talking. Um, uh, all I have to say about this is, man, if you are not in it after those two speeches, you will never be in it, man. This stuff is, read it out loud to yourself. It is great poetry. It's not like particularly deep or insightful. It's just like, I feel, I feel stirred. I want to go once more onto the breach. I'm not even English, but I'm so proud to be English right now. But what I really want to talk about in this act, because um, I think a lot of people misunderstand it, is uh, Henry's speech to the governor of Harfleur. Let's, uh, let's read the second half of it. So he says, what is it to me when you yourselves are cause, if your pure maidens fall into the hand of hot and forcing violation? What reign can hold licentious wickedness when down the hill he holds his fierce career? We may as bootless spend our vain command upon the enraged soldiers in their spoil as send percepts to the Leviathan to come ashore. Therefore, you men of our fleur, 
Take pity of your town and of your people, while yet my soldiers are in my command, while yet the cool and temperate wind of grace o'erblows the filthy and contagious clouds of heady murder, spoil, and villainy. If not, why in a moment look to see the blind and bloody soldier with foul hands defile the locks of your shrill shrieking daughters, your fathers taken by the silver beards and their most reverent heads dashed to the walls, your naked infants spitted upon pikes, whilst the mad mothers with their howls confused do break the clouds, as did the wives of Jewry at at Herod's bloody hunting slaughterman. What say you? Will you yield and this avoid, or guilty in defense be thus destroyed? And a lot of people see that and are like, oh, oh, I don't like that. Laurence Olivier in his film of Henry V cut basically all of that speech, because um, it is like a really scary threat of a, a lot of rape uh, and graphic murder enacted upon innocent people. And a lot of people don't want their King Henry to be like that. Why, why does he have to be so violent? Like Hotspur, I thought we killed Hotspur. I thought we didn't have to deal with him anymore. Other people, like Kenneth Branagh in his Henry V film, lean into this and give Henry the flaw of bloodthirstiness, which one could imagine he had absorbed from Hotspur when he killed him and um, assumed elements of his identity. Um, but I think that neither is the case. I think this is a very clever move. I talked about Henry IV parts one and two being the two parts of Henry's education. Part one is his education in war, part two is his education in diplomacy. And it really seems like this speech is being drawn from his education in war. He's creating a very vivid picture, which is something that the chorus is also doing, creating very vivid pictures, which we are supposed to imagine as real with just his words. But when Henry does it, it's different than when the chorus does it because he has a different role in the play. Um, so when he's doing it, he is saying all of these things. He is painting such a graphic picture so that this will not happen. He knows that if he can say something scary enough, the governor will just surrender and then they won't have to kill any of these people. So this is actually a victory of rhetoric, not of weapons, because it works. The governor says, yeah, I uh, don't want that to happen. We surrender. Our friend Prince Hal hasn't been too corrupted by Hotspur. Then uh, immediately after that, we get the English lesson. So we've just seen how effective use of words can be. Let's teach our love interest some words. Um, so uh, we have a scene of Catherine um, learning some English from Alice, her handmaid, um, mainly like body parts. And she comments on like, how these words do not sound very nice in English. Um, I, I apologize for not warning you that there were extensive French passages in here. Um, I hope that you either speak French or that you were reading a version with a translation. Although I don't know how hard this is. Like in, in, in modern productions, in Shakespeare's day, most people would have understood what was going on. In modern productions, this is a simple enough scene and like you're pointing to the body enough that I think most people can figure out what's going on and this is generally not like subtitled or anything in uh, modern productions. Oh, I should probably mention that between all of these scenes of um, King Henry being like the literal best, we have scenes of the Dauphin being the literal worst. The French king um, is spared the worst of Shakespeare's ire, um, but mainly just so that we can focus it all on the Dauphin and also on his friends who are, are really just like comically awful people saying things like, uh, no mans, but bastards, no mans, no man bastards. Mordieu, ma vie, if they march along on foot with all, I will sell my dukedom to buy a slobbery and a dirty farm in that nook shot an isle of Albion. So yeah, the anti-Gallicism in this play is like very strong and very unsubtle to the point where I would not feel comfortable going with a French person to see this play. To like, nah, it's just, basically just portraying y'all as shit people and also losers. But going back to our hero, uh, he now has to execute Bardolph. Um, Bardolph had uh, stolen something from a church, something called a pax, 
when I was reading this, I looked up what a pax is, but I don't remember. It's not important. He stole something from a church, um, and King Henry had said that they were not going to steal things from France. Um, this is sort of also going into the idea that um, Henry is not looking to conquer France. He is looking to uh, reclaim France because it is his, and he doesn't want to, like, destroy the the artifacts of his own country. Um, so he does, uh, potentially with tears in his eye, uh, order the execution of Bardolf um, for breaking this command, even though Bardolf is one of his friends. Um, and this is where we get some evidence um, that he uh, is uh, dispensing laws, dispensing justice, based on uh, the state as opposed to his own personal preference, um, which is what he claimed uh, at the execution of the traitors, but now we have the proof of it because he's willing to let one of his friends die because he did break the law. And then we move on to Act 4, which is focused on the Battle of Agincourt. Um, so, uh, as usual, we have the chorus um, talking about stuff, and I'm actually going to preview another play briefly right now. Uh, I just want to talk about the line, the armorers accomplishing the knights with busy hammers closing rivets up give dreadful note of preparation. He's talking about what's going on in the camp. The blacksmiths are, um, you know, tightening, I don't know how armor works, but like making sure there are no holes in the armor. And that image is the image of, hold this term in your mind, the classical male body, which I am going to talk about so much when we get to Coriolanus. I know Coriolanus tends to like sneak into a lot of other videos, um, and that's because when we get to Coriolanus, I'm going to have so much to say, and I'm going to need you to make like several intellectual leaps in order to make my point. Um, so I'm trying to like preview enough stuff in other videos. So the classical male body, the classical conception of the male body, is one that is closed. Um, as opposed to the female body, which is open and like stuff moves in and out of it, like penises, babies, menstrual blood, tears, crying is a woman thing because they got holes in their body. Men do not have holes in their body. This mouth? No, men don't have them. Um, uh, but you know, the things, things do not move in and out of a man. They are closed. They are whole. They are, yeah, okay, I think you get it. More on that when we get to Coriolanus. And then the next thing that I made note of is in uh, Act 4, Scene 1, around the line 260. Um, this is after the king has talked to uh, Williams, um, who is skeptical that the king is actually like a good guy who wants the best for his uh, countrymen. Um, and uh, the king has one of these speeches that a lot of Shakespearean historical kings give, which is like, man, it ain't so great to be the king, is it? It's kind of, there's definitely bad things about it. Um, this speech where he talks a lot about um, the, how he is unable to sleep um, because he has all of these things to worry about. Um, whereas a peasant, even though his life is not as good, um, is able to sleep soundly, which is exactly what his father said in the last play. But I don't want to make a parallel with that, I want to go all the way back to Richard II um, and talk about how uh, uh, Henry V here says, Canst thou, when thou commandst the beggar's knee, command the health of it? Um, saying, like, I can command someone to kneel on their knees, but I cannot make those knees well. I do not have that power. I am not omnipotent, meaning I'm just like any other dude. Um, and this is a pretty direct echo of uh, what John of Gaunt said to Richard II. Um, so when Richard says, why uncle thou hast many years to live, Gaunt says, but not a minute, king, that thou canst give. And I think it's important to notice that um, Richard II needs to have this told to him and Henry is able to figure it out on his own. And then let's close by talking about the romantic scene at the end. Uh, unlike Richard II, which closes as a tragedy, this one closes more as a comedy with a, like, a cute romantic scene, um, uh, which is in prose, note. Um, excuse me, I think it's interesting that uh, we do this part in prose, um, which is the language that 
uh, Henry used in the tavern as opposed to in the court. He's always used verse in the court. Um, but here, even though he uses verse at the beginning of the scene when the French king and queen are all there, when they leave and it's just him, Catherine, and Alice, uh, he changes into prose. Um, one, because he's not comfortable with the language. He and Catherine don't really share a common language. Uh, but also because he views this as a personal situation, not as a political situation. Um, I know they met each other 45 minutes ago, but I think Shakespeare is trying to sell us on the like, this is a love match thing. And then this informal colloquial prose style that we've established continues even when the uh, rest of the French court comes back on stage and King Henry is talking to um, Burgundy and the French king uh, in prose. And it's only when you get like right, right to the very end and in the last like 20 lines or so that we switch back into the poetry uh, to formalize the union. Um, uh, but everything else in there is prose. There we go. Henry V. We did it. We did four histories. Uh, and I'll move on to some, some fun comedies next month with Mary Wives of Windsor when Falstaff will resurrect. Although, he, I mean, he doesn't actually resurrect. It is unclear what the timeline relationship is between Mary Wives of Windsor and the Henriad, because um, it doesn't matter. So I'll see you with that next month.